So, Peter, I was going to start the sermon with uh, talking about the man named Simon, see if you guys could figure that one out. But then I kind of threw it out because I changed and I titled the sermon Peter. So Simon Peter, same person. So I, uh, I don't know how, how you guys do this, but we talk about these people that are in the Bible. And all too often, I feel like they're a story. We read through and we know some of the major stories. We know some of the things that went on through Jesus' life and, and Old Testament, all of that kind of stuff. But on the next slide, I've got a picture of what I feel like we oftentimes think of. And if you show that for me. This is the picture of Peter that I feel like we all have, have grown up with. At least, well, I guess I'm a little younger than everybody else, but... But this is that picture that, that the Catholic Church has, and, and it just is that imagery that we have, have grown accustomed to seeing, the imagery of Jesus, where he just looks perfect. My dad talks about that all the time in his messages. He just has, we have this, this ideal of what it was. And through this message, I'd like you to understand Peter a little more like the next picture. This is like a little more modernized version, right? It still looks like a biblical human being uh, that we would expect to see. This was uh, actually a picture from Peter as portrayed in the Chosen uh, video series. Um, They're going through the Gospels and they're doing a fantastic job of, of bringing the Gospel to real life, which again is what we're trying to do today. And possibly, just possibly, if anything, uh, you might understand Peter to look a little bit like this one. See, Peter is actually just a regular guy. He might not have had a kayak at that time, but he was a fisherman. He was out there. So what I did is I printed out a complete timeline of Peter's life. And uh, if you have your phones or your Bibles, it would be a good time to get it out because we're going to go through a whole lot of Scripture, and we're just going to understand a little bit of who Peter is. I've not corroborated all of these dates, but they uh, have some, uh, some approximate dates of when some of these things would have happened. And uh, Simon Peter, or Simon at the time, actually, would have been born around 1 BC. And around 25 AD to 27 AD was when a lot of the information that we have about him starts to really pop up. Simon would have married whoever his wife was. We don't know. They don't talk about them too much, but they do talk about Simon's, or Peter's, mother-in-law. That's one of the miracles that Jesus does very early on. Simon marries, and he has children, and they set, settle in Capernaum. Fast forward a little bit to where Simon meets Jesus. He meets Jesus through his brother, Andrew, who was a follower of John the Baptist. So that takes us to John chapter 1, verse 40 and 41. John chapter 1, verse 40 and 41. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. John was proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas. So very early on, Peter's brother, Peter's a fisherman, we know that, we'll find that out a little bit sooner, a little, in a few minutes, but Peter's brother, Andrew, is already a disciple of John the Baptist. So there is certainly some amount of religion already going on in this family. And it doesn't seem like a huge amount of stretch for them to follow Jesus, especially knowing that Andrew has already chosen to be a disciple of John the Baptist. So that is the beginning. This is the first place that Jesus and 
Peter meet. Well, Peter and Andrew are fishing on the sea. They're fishermen. They did that for a living. Fishermen back then are probably fairly similar to fishermen now, I would say. Uh, not like the guy that I showed, but, you know, the guys that go out and do king crab and all of that fun stuff. It was probably a, a fairly dangerous job. It was probably uh, very hard work pulling in the nets. Uh, and their whole purpose was to get fish, which was common folk food. So they were a hardworking crew of people, and there were typically a lot of boats all going out and competing for the fish, but also somewhat working together. So this is from Matthew chapter 4. We're going to bounce all over the place. So Matthew chapter 4, and i got to go to it myself. Chapter 4, verse 18. This is where Peter is called to be a disciple. And it's very fascinating to me that it's such a short passage. When you're experiencing something that you are taking and completely changing course, it seems like there would be more to it. Uh, so there seems like there would probably be some amount of backstory that would say that Peter and Andrew had more information of who Jesus was uh, than they really let on. But verse 18 in uh, Matthew chapter 4. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. That's the end of the story. He goes on and he finds other people and he asks them to follow him. He comes up with four disciples, just out of fishermen, that are out doing their job. I think if I had, uh, I'm in construction, as most of you know, I think that if uh, I had some knowledge that there was somebody special and I felt like I could be taken care of, I think that I would run away from my job pretty fast, too. If uh, Farming, do you think, would you, if somebody, uh, you know? It's, your job's a little more fun than mine, I think. Driving tractors, anyways. But I think it would take a lot of faith. It would take a lot of faith. To walk away from everything that you know and everything that you have. What's interesting about Peter is there's not a whole lot of times that they talk about the financial side, being concerned about what they need. Uh, as I was reading through and getting some backstory, the one person who was most concerned and brought up multiple times about their finances was Judas, interestingly enough. So this is where Peter becomes a disciple of Jesus. Jesus was walking along. He came upon them and said, hey, you guys want to follow me? They said yes. Somewhere around 30 A.D., Jesus visits the home of Peter, and he heals his sick mother-in-law. This is one of the first times that Peter sees a miracle. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole story, but it's found in uh, Matthew 8, 14, and 15. And Peter is starting to see some things that other people aren't able to see. They're starting to witness parts of Jesus that increase his faith and increase his understanding of who Jesus is. Peter casts his net into the deep ocean. We're going to come back to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 7. So this is again where, uh, where they're very early on in this and in the discipleship. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night. Now they worked hard at night because it was really hot during the day. So if they would go out at night, then they would have the reprieve of the coolness and they could do their work easier. So they were accustomed to working at night. 
But it says, we worked all last night and we didn't catch a thing. I mean, I can imagine how deflating that would be. You work hard at doing something, especially where the fruits of your labor are not necessarily going to be realized. If I work hard at putting siding on my house, most likely there's going to be siding on my house at the end of the day, unless I do it all wrong somehow. But in this case, you can work extremely hard, be completely exhausted, and have no fish whatsoever. If I were to go fishing, that's exactly what would happen. They worked hard all night, and they didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And at this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout to help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. It's a fascinating story in and of itself, but then this, I think, is where you really get to see a glimpse into the character of who Peter is. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Peter is an interesting person because we'll find out even a little bit more coming up. He's very bold. He's very, uh, to a point, in your face. And he is willing to just jump out there and stick his neck out. And sometimes he's completely wrong. But in this case, he is wrong. He, he doesn't understand, and maybe he's not wrong because of... Because of the fact that he is trying, doesn't believe Jesus, but partly because he is so exhausted, he just doesn't think that it's going to happen, and he doesn't have the faith that what Jesus is saying is going to be true. But as soon as he realizes that he gets all these fish because that's what Jesus asked him to do, his response is not gratitude and thanks immediately, but it's that he realized very quickly that he was not believing in what Jesus was asking of him to do. He was awestruck by the number of fish, and he called himself a sinful man because he was not listening to Jesus. All of these things as we're going through the life of Peter are certainly molding and and bringing, shaping Peter into the man that Jesus needs him to be upon his crucifixion. There's a story in 142. It's all in the same spot. It's kind of, we're jumping around a little bit, but uh, John 142, which was back when Jesus first meets Peter, and he gives him the name, uh, Simon, gives him the name Peter, right? Cephas. I'm not fully sure of the the custom of changing names and all that at the time. It seems like Jesus had that ability to do that whenever he kind of felt like it. But it's interesting to me, at least, that that a man who he, he was somewhere in his 30s, Peter was, that Jesus would say, I'm going to call you Peter when his name is Simon, There's reason behind it, but I'm going to call you Peter. And Peter just accepts that as his new name, and that is the name that we know him by. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 23 through 26, there's a story of a young girl who is sick, and his father comes to Jesus And the girl actually dies while the man is talking to Jesus. And this is another situation where Peter is just gaining more understanding of who Jesus is. And Peter, one of the only few people, were able to go with Jesus. And he witnessed Jesus bringing this little girl back to life. All of these things are just helping to build the understanding of who Jesus is as Peter is to take on the beginning of the church after Jesus goes up to heaven. The apostles and Simon Peter see Jesus walking on the water. This is one of my favorite stories. Peter asked Jesus to command him to walk on the water. We're going to go right through this. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verses 24 through 33.
Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had, wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. Again, three o'clock in the morning, they were working at night, all typical. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. They cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said, take courage, for I am here. This is where, again, you get to see a little bit of who Peter really is. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat. You can only imagine. This guy's a fisherman. This is his domain. This is where he lives. When you're out in the middle of the water, you don't jump in. (laughs) <laughs> it's just not what, they didn't have flotation devices. You jump in, they probably didn't even really know how to swim that well. You jump in, you're probably dying. But he's so boastful, he's f- so proud, he's so quick thinking, or maybe not thinking, but maybe just quick acting. So Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. Wow, it's amazing. But then he started to see the strong wind and the waves, and he became terrified, and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. So he still has faith that Jesus has the power, but he's scared. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And Jesus says, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat and the wind stopped, then the disciples worshipped worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. So they're just, every single story is just building and building and building their understanding of who Jesus is. In this story, I just feel like Peter is so relatable. You jump in with your two feet, You get a little nervous, but you reach out to God. You reach out to Jesus, and you know that he is there for you. Matthew 16 is our next spot, and this is... This is Jesus coming to the disciples. Matthew 16, verse 13, starting at... Jesus asked the disciples a question. And again, this gives you that full glimpse that Peter loves to be the one to talk. He loves to be the one to get that answer out there. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's the right answer. Sometimes he's right. Sometimes he puts something out there and he's the right one. It's exactly what Jesus is looking for. You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I think that his understanding of who John the Baptist was, and they believed that John the Baptist was a strong man of faith. And seeing miracle after miracle and walking with Jesus helps in this. But it says God told him that Jesus is the Messiah. Now I say to you that that you are Peter, which means rock, And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. In this point, Jesus is giving Peter some amazing power. Not like power, you know, genie power or anything like that, but 
He's giving him something and challenging him to step up and to be a leader. He likes to blurt things out, but at times, he blurts out the right thing. He just told Jesus, just told Peter, that on Peter, the back of Peter, the church, the bride of Christ, the church will be built upon his back. The next story is in Matthew 16, verses 21. And this goes to tell us that even though he has the right answer sometimes, other times he doesn't. Other times he can't understand what Jesus is telling him because it hasn't come to time yet. I believe that about a lot of things that we have here on earth. There's a lot of things that we just don't understand because we haven't reached a certain point in our life or We just don't have the context to understand here on earth what heaven or hell are really truly like. But in this verse, verse 21, from then on Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. I find it fascinating, and this is, I mean, it's obviously the Everything we talk about here is about Jesus. But this is is primarily based on Peter, not Jesus. But I find it fascinating that Jesus utilized the Peters. He utilized the people that were out there working hard, doing their thing, not really making a huge difference, but just grinding through their days. And the people that you would think that he would have used in his ministry, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were leaders of the religion, were the ones that he rebuked. Picking back up, he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. And Jesus, we know, talked a lot in parables, right? He talked a lot in ways that in some ways, I feel like they were more helpful to understand the stories. In other ways, at least today, I feel like they're more confusing. But it says that he was speaking plainly so that they fully could understand exactly what he was trying to tell them. He just told them that he would be, he would be suffered and he would be, many terrible things would be done at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would rise again from the dead. And Peter's response is, hey Jesus, come over here, i got to talk to you for a second in person, because I just don't want to make a fool of you in front of the other disciples. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. He's bold. He puts himself out there. He goes to Jesus and says, there's no way I'll ever let this happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get away from me, Satan. You are dangerous. A dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, Some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Peter is being severely shaped here. Jesus tells him, you are going to be the leader of my church. You are going to form the church and be the first pope, maybe, they say? No. But the the foundation, the the crutch in which the church is, is formed on, 
And his immediate response is, there's no way that you're going to die, Jesus. You're too important to me. And Jesus puts him in his place. And to the point, to to Peter's favor, I, I see that while he's bold, numerous times it seems as though he respects Jesus to an, a point to enough to where when Jesus tells him what's right, he takes it. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 3. This is the transfiguration. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want... I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Jesus came over to them and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. And they only saw Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Peter doesn't have faith in Jesus just because he was told and he has seen some things. Peter has seen all the powers of Jesus. Peter has seen him raise children and his mother-in-law and other people from the dead, from healed from sick, the lepers, the lame, the deafs, the mutes. Peter has experienced so many things in his short time with Jesus, and yet he still doesn't fully understand it. In Matthew 26, verse 35, we're going to back up a little bit. We'll go to verse 31. We'll start at the the heading. Another one of those moments, this is getting extremely close to when Jesus actually is going to be taken up on the cross. And everybody knows these stories, but it's just fascinating what's going on in the mind of Peter and how much he waffle waffles back and forth as he's continuing to be groomed into the leader that Jesus needs him to be. Verse 31, on the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and I will meet you there. It's pretty plain English. I mean, it wasn't English at that point in time, but it's pretty plain. It's it's very obvious. Jesus is telling them exactly what is going to happen And yet over the the, the coming days and weeks, it's like Jesus never said this to him. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. He still is trying to stand up to Jesus. 
He's still trying to say that, that he knows better. There's no way that Peter could ever deny knowing Jesus. But yet that very night. Immediately following, Jesus brings the disciples, or a few of the disciples right into the Garden of Gethsemane where he is praying at nighttime. And I know they've been out of fishing for a while, and sitting in a garden is very different than working on a fishing boat. But Jesus, they're having some, some extremely difficult conversations, at least I would think. And Jesus tells them to stay alert and stay ready. And clearly they also believe that this is a massive fight ready to happen based on the ear cut off at the end, right? But even though they, he understands what's going on and the gravity of the situation, he understands where we're at, he falls asleep. Peter, the bold person who is supposed to be the leader of the church, can't even stay awake when Jesus asks him to. I mean, if I'm tired and Jesus has asked me to do something, I'm probably going to stand up and walk around, do push-ups, something. I don't know if they had cribbage back then, but something to keep your mind going. And yet, he can't. Shortly thereafter, after Jesus talks to them about falling asleep twice, is where they're arrested and we all know this story where Judas comes up and he kisses Jesus and the man comes to take Jesus away and Peter fights him off, cutting off his ear. He lets his emotions get in the way. He lets, he lets what he's thinking Go past what he's been told over and over and over again. Even if he didn't want to believe it when Jesus told it to him, Jesus made sure that Peter understood what he was trying to explain. That he was going to give his life and that that was the ransom to be paid for our sins. But yet Peter goes into fight mode. After he couldn't stay awake, And he cuts the guy's ear off. And Jesus does his thing and heals him back up and surrenders himself. But that's not what Peter wanted him to do. I find it fascinating that through all that information, through all that conversation, all that life with Jesus, he still just didn't get it. He still just didn't understand what Jesus' life was really there for. And then, of course, before the rooster crows in the morning, Peter denies Jesus three times. Doing exactly what he said the night before that he was not going to do. And he probably would have been hung on a cross had he not denied him. And so, to a point, I guess, if you're playing a chess match, I could see that Him denying Jesus was Jesus' intention as he needed Peter. I wouldn't say, I guess I shouldn't say he needed Peter, but Peter was the man who was going to lead the church. So going after crucifixion, in uh, John chapter 20, John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. This is when the tomb is empty. And of course, the the ladies, the Marys, find uh, the empty tomb first. But early on a Sunday morning, 
While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. See, if he was doing those crunches and push-ups back in the Garden of Gethsemane, or doing some wind sprints, maybe he would have been faster. <laughs> they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings laying there. While the cloth had been, that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and laying apart from the other wrappings, then the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until they, had, they still had understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead, then they went home. Peter has seen a lot of stuff, and it's a pretty short amount of time. His, his person, his character, his attributes, of, they don't really change much. But his understanding does morph over time. It, it shifts, it shapes through seeing all of these different things. Peter ran to see him. He ran to see because I can only imagine what Peter is thinking in those couple of days. Questioning whether or not Jesus really was who he said he was. And when that opportunity came that Jesus had been risen or taken from the grave, he ran to see. He was the first disciple to come in and see his, his linens laying on the table. Jesus also appeared to Peter before appearing to any of the other disciples. Jesus also appeared in front of all of the disciples. So John chapter 20, verses ni verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This time where Peter receives the Holy Spirit, that's where Peter really changes the most. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. He gives this to Peter as well. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am writing with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Peter is changed into being that follower of Jesus that was, that was bold. 
he still has those attributes, right? He still is bold. He still wants to say the right things. He still wants to be that strong leader. But instead of always having Jesus right there to correct him, Peter now has to do it through the Holy Spirit. And you see an amazing change from that. We don't have a ton of information about Peter after Jesus ascends into heaven. We have some. In the book of Acts, there's quite a bit in the beginning part of the book. Jesus becomes that leader that Jesus needed. Peter becomes that leader Jesus needed. That's what I wanted to say. In Acts 2, now that he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter gives a message to the people of Jerusalem and in that message, he speaks, and he speaks powerfully, and people listen. And through that, they form the community. They form that thing that we call the church, the community of people that come together to eat, to drink, to worship. And then there are multiple different times where Peter performs miracles with the help of the Holy Spirit. So this Peter, this guy, this worker, this fisherman, not the saint or the high guy that we sometimes can make him out to be, Jesus called him he could have called anybody, and he called Peter. He called Peter because he's bold. He's brave. He's willing. He has a willing mind, and, and he's willing to just jump out and do what Jesus asked him to do. He's loyal. I think that being a part of that working class is part of what makes him desirable to Jesus. He's not afraid to get down and get dirty. He's not afraid to do the things that he has to do, even in the most difficult situations. But Peter wasn't perfect. Peter messed up, just like I do. Peter didn't understand. He didn't fully get what was happening, even as it was going on, even after Jesus told him so specifically this is what's going to happen. But even though Peter is not the perfect human being, God uses him in powerful ways. And that's how we can be, we can relate ourselves to who Peter is. We're not always going to have the right thing to say, we're not always going to come up with the right answer. But if we can have some boldness to us, if we can have a little bit of brave within us, we can be strong and we can fall back on Jesus when we mess up. We can admit that we were wrong. Jesus can use us in powerful ways as he used Peter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word and for the people that you used. I think it would have been all too easy to use all the people that were polished and figured out, that knew what was going on, that knew all the law back and forth. But that's not what you, cho you chose to use. You chose to use people like Peter and Paul. People who severely messed up in their life. People who doubt. But that they're willing to place their faith strongly within you. That's who you're looking for. You're not looking for perfection. You're looking for people to place 
their faith in you. We thank you for the example that Peter is and for the love that you show to each and every one of us. In your name, amen.